So hello, and welcome to the Chorus Forum on Improving Scholarly Publishing Metadata. Today is the fourth of our Chorus Forums for this year, and this one was put together with the hard work of Scott Deneen from Optica Publishing Group. Today's forum of over 322 registrants would not be possible without the generous sponsorship coming from our platinum sponsors, ACM and Clarivate, our gold sponsors, ACS, AIP Publishing, and Geoscience World, and our silver sponsor, STM. As our speakers present today, feel free to use Zoom's QA feature found at the bottom of the Zoom webinar to ask your questions. This will either be answered by the speakers live or in the QA window. Also feel free to upvote questions that you think are important so we are sure to get to them. Today's forum will run until 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and will also be recorded for later viewing. We have two excellent sessions lined up for you. Session one, where I will be the moderator, will have a speaker panel on the overview of weak spots of scholarly publishing metadata. And a big thank you to Megan from Iowa State University for stepping in at the last minute for Lisa Hinchcliffe, who was called away due to a family emergency. This will be followed by a short break, including an interactive poll, which we all hope you'll stick around for. Then we'll go on to session two, where Scott will moderate another stellar cast of speakers on promising solutions for improving the accuracy of scholarly publishing metadata. So let's get to it. So we at Chorus are very, our, our community effort uh, dedicated to making open research work. Our goals are to help our main stakeholders of publishers, institutions, and funders scale their OA compliance. We work to develop metrics about open data, improve the overall quality of their metadata related to open research, and host forums and workshops like today's forum to connect with stakeholders so they can learn and hopefully build trust with one another. But we at Chorus also are very much persistent identifier junkies, as you can see here. PIDs are very central to what we do. Publishers collect and send content DOIs and funder IDs to Crossref at the 12 o'clock spot. We then consume that information so we can check whether an article is archived for preservation at clocks and or portico, and whether or not the article first appeared in a preprint server or is appearing on an agency portal, whether or not there is public grant information, whether or not authors have ORCID ID records, and whether there are relevant data sets. And all of that then leads to monitoring and auditing public access on the publisher's site for uh, public access. So you can see how this ties into today's session on improving scholarly metadata. So I've got the honor of being session one moderator. And first up is Andrea Medina-Smith, data librarian from the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or better known to me as NIST. Over to you. Good morning, everyone. Like uh, Howard said, my name is Andrea Medina-Smith. I'm a data librarian at NIST, where I am responsible for making um, our research outputs public. So a lot of our public access activities, such as um, getting our data published fall and um, our publications into PMC, which is our repository of record for publications falls under my purview. All right, next. Quick disclaimer, I'm gonna mention a bunch of commercial products and nonprofit entities, and none of this means that NIST is endorsing these or that they're necessarily the best um, solution to the problem at hand. It's just what NIST uses. All right, next, please. So NIST is sort of a triathlete of service, provider, of service providers. We are a publisher, we're a funder, and we're also a library. Um, the publishing wing of NIST sits under the library organizationally. Uh, our funding work is uh, much, much smaller than our intramural work, um, but we want to track both our intramural and our extramural grants recipients, all of their work we need to track just as much as um, the intramural uh, research that happens within our campuses. Uh, as a publisher, we publish our NIST technical reports and the recently closed Journal of Research of NIST. We have been publishing um, Let's see, technical reports started, I believe, in 1905, and our what became the Journal of Research of NIST started in one format or another in 1901. So we've been 
publishing for over 120 years at this point. And finally, we've got the library where we do the publishing work and that's also where a lot of the metric tracking of outputs happens. Uh, next, please. So title of my talk is metadata, a label for our objects. And most of us know what metadata is, data about data. It's all the bibliographic information about a given object, uh, physical or otherwise. It can be preservation information, lots of things like that. But we can also think of it as a, analogous to the label on a soup can for a digital object. Now, when I was in library school and first was given this analogy, our uh, cataloging professor had a can of, or several cans of food out and asked us all to sort of guess what was in them. And um, none of us really could. He chose ones that had no markings on them, not even the best by dates. Uh, and then we were asked to open them and none of us really wanted to. We knew there'd be terrible things inside and, and there were, there was um, Vienna sausages, uh, corn that looked like it had had better days and then some sort of soup, I can't remember what. Had we had the labels, we would have had much more information, wouldn't have uh, maybe even opened them. Maybe we would have just passed on that, uh, knowing what was inside. Um, so without that soup label and without our metadata, we can't tell from the outside and sometimes not even from the inside of a digital object what it is because we don't necessarily have the tools to open it. Um, if we don't have information about what the file format is, all that sort of stuff. So that's what our metadata is for. Next, please. Here you can see I have three different Campbell's tomato soup labels. Um, starting from the back on the upper left, that is a the oldest one I could find that had sort of the full spread of what was on the label. And there's directions, there's a lot of ad copy, you can tell what other soups Campbell's makes, but you can't actually tell what's in it other than tomato soup. There's no nutritional information, there's no uh, ingredients, um, nothing like that. So that's what I would consider extremely basic metadata, you know, a very basic description of what is in that can. We know it was uh, the, the maker or the creator was Campbell's. We know that it's a condensed tomato soup. And let's see, we know, uh, I guess the company is actually not Campbell's, it's Joseph Campbell Productions or producers. And we know that it was made in Camden, New Jersey. Not all of those things would help us use it, but you know, at least there's directions and we know that it's tomato soup versus beef with barley or something like that. The middle image is a slightly newer label. This time they actually have not only the uh, weight and grams or the weight of volume, I guess, of the soup, but it also has um, directions and the ingredients. So we've got a little more information about what's in here. And finally, on the bottom right, that's a modern contemporary label where I've highlighted the nutrition facts. So not only do we know how to make it, what is inside of it, but we also know the nutritional content um, and a little bit more information about, you know, it's made in the US, there's a recycled, a recycling label on it. So we know the can and the uh, label can be recycled, sorry, logo, not label. Uh, so at, over time, we can see that the metadata has gotten richer. Um, this iterative process has also occurred with metadata for our digital objects. So next slide, please. Here I have three representations of the basic bibliographic metadata for one of our um, technical reports. And this is actually a, hist a history book about NIST, excuse me, the National Bureau of Standards, which we were before NIST um, in the 50s and 60s. On the upper image, we have the XML metadata that we send to Crossref to register the DOI. Then we have the metadata from our own publications catalog on the lower left-hand side. And finally, uh, the title page of the book proper, which would be what um, a library getting this book for the first time might use to create a catalog record, that sort of metadata. All right, so next up, now we can look at some of the iterative improvements that we have made with our metadata over time. 
So at the beginning of our process um, of registering our publications for DOIs, we got gave really basic information, first name, last name, where they were in the sequence of, um, of authors and whether or not they were an author editor to the actual contributor role that happened there. Um, and now we can send in their affiliations with um, both a ROAR and an ISNI IDs. Uh, we can send in their ORCIDs. And these are all things that we add in. The ORCID, hopefully they'll give us, we'll do some searches on that. Um, but typically we pull that from their person record at NIST. And then we have listings for our, all of our labs in addition to NIST with ROAR and with ISNI that we send in. Next, please. We have made iterative improvements on relationships. So not only do we now add in um, preprint relationship, if that happens, or uh, version um, relationship, so is subsequent to, um, to a given DOI, we also now make sure that every single uh, DOI that we register has references included so that we can link the DOIs from what we are registering to what they have cited, just to make that web a little bit more complete. Okay, next please. Uh, we've also put in more information, um, including the abstract. We add licensing information. We add our funding funder ID from Crossref in. Um, and I think that's all the examples I have here. Yeah, that's right. So over time, we have looked at the metadata that we are submitting. We have looked at the available schemas and what fields are, are being added in or what we haven't taken advantage of. And over the past, I guess, close to 10 years now, we've definitely made these records that we're sending in much richer. Um, and they're really helping to make this knowledge graph between all of the different participants in the scholarly literature. Next, please. So yeah, we're filling in these gaps in the knowledge graph. We use funder IDs from Crossref. We put in ORCIDs. And currently, we do have a mandate that NIST researchers um, obtain an ORCID and use it. So we're getting more and more of those. We use ROARs to note affiliations. Uh, we make sure we put our licenses in there and we have a specific NIST license uh, for our data when we send in data sets to data site. And then we also have um, a statement of public domain for our publications. And then we also are shoring up our relationship metadata, making sure that we can show, excuse me, um, all of the ties between various scholarly outputs back to the one that we're registering at this time. Next, please. So what is it that we can do in these various roles? Well, publishers, we want to be publishing with the most robust metadata possible using PD, excuse me, PIDs all the way down. Any place that there is the option to use a PID, we as a publisher are aiming to use it. Um, there are a couple more that we, we're we not quite there yet, um, but with the new Nelson memo coming out of OSTP, it's going to force us. So specifically for our grants, we will be adding grant IDs of um, one sort or another, and that should be happening within the next year or so. All right, next please. As a funder, uh, we require that grant numbers or PIDs are listed in the acknowledgements of a um, given paper or data set. So that's part of the grant um, contract that's signed. And we participate in Chorus. Uh, and we let Howard and Tara and everyone at Chorus know what sort of metadata we need to get our work done. Um, so that's why we're participating there. And next slide. Finally, libraries. Our role is to support all of these other parts by helping to our users get ORCIDs. 
Uh, we had a fun outreach day in the before times. Uh, on Valentine's Day, we got a couple potted orchids and talked to people about getting orchids and gave out candy. And it was actually, you know, I think we got about 20 people to actually register that day. And this was four or five years ago. Um, so we, we thought that was a really successful event. And finally, um, we can take advantage of the event data APIs from Crossreffin Data Site to help show our researchers what's going on with their papers and their research output once it's out of our hands. Once it's been published, if we can show them what's happening with all of it, that um, supports their work in other ways. So next slide. I want to say a big thank you to everyone at Crossref and also to my colleagues, Catherine Miller and Kathy Sharpless. They have helped me out significantly with these projects and much of it also rests on their shoulders. If there's any questions or comments um, and you don't get to it in the Q&A today, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my email is right there. So thank you very much. Back to you, Howard. Great. Thanks, Sandra. So we're going to hold questions until after all the speakers have gone. So I'm going to move us on to Sasha, who is the content technology architect from Optica Publishing Group. Sasha. Thank you, Howard. Um, I will illustrate the problems with uh, weak spot and metadata using read and publish agreements as uh, an example. Next slide, please. I work as a content technology architect for Optica Publishing Group, which is a publishing division of uh, Optica, uh, formerly known as OSA. And uh, we have the largest collection of peer-reviewed journals and uh, um, conference papers uh, in the interdisciplinary field of the science of light, which is optics and photonics. Next slide, please. So today, uh, I will um, briefly remind you uh, about the nature of written publish agreements and then focus on the problems with the key pieces of metadata, such as author affiliations, article types, licensing, and funding, and then uh, talk a little bit about metadata retention and preservation before reaching my conclusions. Next slide, please. So what is a written publish agreement? It is essentially a contract between the publisher and the library consortium where the consortium uh, members uh, get access to the publisher's subscription content, uh, not by paying a subscription fee, but rather by paying uh, article processing charges or APCs for the authors who publish in the publisher's journals, uh, provided that um, those authors are affiliated with an institutional member of the consortium. Um, of, I will refer to an author who is eligible for their APC's charges paid by the consortium as RNP beneficiary. Next slide, please. And so um, the first um, problematic metadata um, element that I will focus on is authors. And um, who is eligible for this RNP benefits? Is it only corresponding author or any author? And if it is only corresponding author and there are more than one, how to indicate which corresponding author is the main one? Um, and in terms of um, markup, there are two ways of indicating who the corresponding is in chats. So we have no um, reliable way of indicating that. And regardless, how to indicate that a particular author or authors are eligible for read and publish benefits. In terms of markup, we have no best practice and no recommendation to do that. So we have no consensus. Furthermore, um, how to identify any authors or in the or the uh, read and publish eligible author in particular? You can say we can use ORCID, but um, the ORCID 
is not universally um, supplied by the authors and not all um, systems involved in the scholarly publishing ecosystem can deal with ORCIDs. I believe you will hear more about that in the next presentation. You can say, okay, we can use name and email, especially uh, relying on the domain, institutional domain in the email, but was, as you can imagine, it is not very reliable either. Next slide, please. If uh, we base our RNP eligibility on the contributor's role in producing the scholarly output, then we are in luck because we have credit taxonomy and uh, just for reuse group recommendation on how to use it. However, if we base this eligibility on contribution level, as you can see, um, there is no taxonomy and no recommendation. So there is no consensus on that level. Next slide, please. In terms of affiliations, we can talk about two types of affiliation based on timing. Affiliation that the author had at the time research was done and the current affiliation. But structurally, in terms of markup, there is no way to indicate this distinction. Both are usually uh, tagged using the same element. And short of analyzing the textual content of the affiliation to, just to decide which one it is, we have no way of distinguishing be between the two. And if the business rules specify that only one type of affiliation makes the author eligible, that's a problem. Now, um, in terms of identifier, we have the whole alphabet soup of the possible identifiers as ROR ID, GRID, Ringgold, cross refunder ID, ODOI, and ISNI. And we have no um, consensus about which one is preferable. But uh, even whatever identifier we use, we have a problem of granularity. We know that affiliations are usually have a huge hierarchical um, uh, structure and to assign the ID at the level of the RNP participation institution can be a challenge. Again, if the author is affiliated with more than one affiliation and only one of them is makes uh, his or him or her eligible, then we need to indicate which institution is primary. Another use case, if the author is affiliated, affiliated with two institutions, one from one consortium and another from another consortium, uh, which consortium is responsible for paying the APC charges. We do need to indicate which affiliation is primary, but in terms of markup or um, metadata, there is no recommendation on how to do that. Next slide, please. Now, um, it is possible that not all um, article types are eligible, are, are particip are eligible for participating in those recent published um, benefits, but we um, have no consensus on about that. More importantly, in terms of licensing, Usually, those uh, read and published deal require that a certain license be applied, but which one? It could be CC BY. For some consortium uh, from Great Britain, it could be Crown Copyright. Um, for Commonwealth um, uh, countries like uh, Australia, it also be Crown Copyright. And even if it is CC BY, what type of CC BY we are supposed to indicate? There are many flavors. Finally, in terms of funding, um, what is the, uh, well, are we supposed to indicate that uh, a particular consortium funded uh, pay the, um, who paid the APC charges is a funder? Must it be indicated or may, may or may not it be indicated? There is no consensus on that, leaving aside uh, the question of identifier 
this finding where it can be identified in the acknowledgements or in uh, the special finding section. There is no consensus on that. Next slide, please. Now let's talk a little bit about metadata retention and preservation. I would contend that in 500 years, it is still important uh, who the author is of the article, um, when it was published, like a publication date, what the title was, etc. However, is it going to matter in 500 years that it was a library consortium that pays the APC charges and the author was eligible for that? So one could argue that we can distinguish the pro between production metadata, which is ephemeral, and long-term preservation metadata, which is to be preserved. So is the read and published metadata worth preserving or should it be removed upon publication? Well, we can uh, counter that, uh, that uh, by saying that the read and published data is very important for auditing be it by library, libraries or funders or internal audits by the publisher. And it is important for business intelligence because to renew, to the, or for the publisher to decide whether to renew, cancel or renegotiate read and publish agreement, it is necessary to examine what the uptake was and we need to be able to examine that. Also, this data could be very valuable if it were shared with Crossref, so there could be interchange. But the community st standards and best practices are still emerging, and Crossref cannot do that. So perhaps a solution could be to retain this written published metadata in a publisher's version and Crossref databases, but not transmit it to uh, Portico and Logs and Logs for long-term preservation. Next slide, please. So, in conclusion, um, we can say that the heterogeneity or diversity of read and published business models, the differences in what metadata is considered significant, the lack of recommended markup practices, and the absence of metadata retention guidelines create challenges in findability, accessibility, interoperability, reusability, and last but not least, because I spend most of my time on validating metadata uh, in building community-wide metadata validation tools. Uh, thank you, and I will be happy to answer any questions at the end of the session. Thanks, Sasha, very much. Um, our final speaker in session one is Megan O'Donnell, the head of research data services from Iowa State University, University Library. Over to you, Megan. Hi, everyone. So. Unlike most of today's speakers, I work primarily of data sets rather than papers. And before I start, I want to acknowledge that a lot of progress has been made in this area in the last few years, but keeping metadata conventions up to date with new needs with, is a challenge, especially as data science and data informed decision making has changed expectations and needs across industries and academics. Uh, this is why I put the word actionable in my presentation title, because I want to focus on metadata that we can use to do things, not just metadata that um, tells us things. Next slide, please. So uh, I, as the head of research data services, I work a lot with research data sets. I manage an institutional data repository. Um, I curate and publish data sets. And in the process, I also advise, consult, and teach researchers about handling data and the importance of metadata. And I also work with a lot of metadata gray areas where there are no standards or the standards are not well developed. Um, and so my approach to this whole topic is that publication metadata is data and um, everything we make has a purpose and has a use, but then there's also those unexpected uses or new uses that Sasha alluded to that we haven't quite solved yet or we may not even have anticipated yet. Next slide, please. So as an overview of how libraries uh, play into this, um, libraries are huge drivers and mechanisms of discovery and knowledge making um, in academia and with the public. We are both consumers and producers of metadata. 
and we're information and data management experts who are really good at systems and um, information systems and how um, things link together and all of that is driven by metadata. And we're also maintainers of official records, but especially for the context of this talk, we're not in charge of most of the scholarly publishing records. And so that puts us in this kind of middleman position where we're taking in a lot of other people's records and we have to figure out, and they're all, most of them are decent, but they're all a little different. And we have to try and make them all work together in systems so people can search them and use them. Um, and more, especially now more than ever, we're also publishers, and this is both with text products and with data sets. Next slide, please. So typical metadata that we run into with libraries um, for scholarly publishing include things in institutional repositories, and this includes both original works like uh, electronic theses and dissertations, tech reports, extension publications, um, grant quarterly reports, and things like that. A lot of things, things are not assigned DOIs. They're in using other systems. And for this reason, they're usually excluded from this really rich scholarly linked data environment because that DOI is kind of a magic key that integrates it into a lot of other systems with like alt metric tracking in different ways than um, other things and the ability to add in some of this more powerful linked data. Um, green open access is also a really important part of institutional repositories. And we can put copies of open access preprints and manuscripts and copies of the original manuscripts if we have the permissions. But then this creates a second set of valuable date use data that has to be reconciled with like other copies. So researchers end up with multiple sources of valuable metrics to dig through and understand. And so that's one of the weaknesses um, for the scholar side. Next, please. Uh, ORCIDs are a big deal. <laughs> um, Andrea did a great job of highlighting their importance. Uh, they are typically opt-in, but with really uneven adoption, and they are not part of our university systems, both in our HR systems, which manage like staff hiring and payment and just like even how we sign into systems. And then they're also not baked into most library systems. A lot of them have to be configured and maintained separately. And that means we're having programmers on staff to build and maintain those things, which is um, not always available. And the other problem of ORCIDs is right because by design, it's an author's record, they're highly reliant on the authors to do the maintenance. And so this means if the authors are not maintaining and linking into other things, it just doesn't work. And so if you have a private ORCID account, there's no way even for me as a librarian where to go, oh yeah, this is you, I can link to you to something. And so I think libraries can do a lot of outreach for this, but there's also a chance to retroactively update records um, with ORCID IDs if we can get like the whole opting in and adoption part solved a bit better. Next slide, please. So emerging metadata needs, resources and centers such as high performance computing and specialized images. Image centers are uh, usually grant funded and very expensive, contain expensive resources such as machinery and infrastructure, but also uh, very highly trained staff. And so these folks want to keep track of what both their equipment and their staff are doing. And since they're not usually authors on papers, there's no way to easily track this and report back. So need a need for a PID for this is overdue. And when libraries do get requests for this and there is no standard right now, some of us issue DOIs. Some, it's possible to maybe provide an author attribution, but it's pretty rare. Um, when we do have a standard, Libraries are in a good position to manage and update the records for these resources, but we do need that standard to be established and adopted first. Next slide, please. Another emerging metadata, as Sasha talked about, is the billing verification needed for read and publish agreements. Uh, over here, some of the more common things we get is folks will list their college and not necessarily the university and so, or a lab or a research center if it's jointly funded. 
And this means that there's just confusion about where they actually work and who, if they're eligible, much less who should be billed. Uh, typos with email addresses occur, in which case the library will never be contacted. Um, we also have fun things where we have child organizations where with different email addresses and there is no way for an outsider to know that it is affiliated with our university. Uh, querying Roar is potentially a good way to integrate this, but it's not necessarily granular enough. So for Iowa State University, Ames Laboratory is a related organization for us, um, not necessarily a child organization because they're a Department of Energy lab, but they're housed on Iowa State University and they're fac we have faculty there. Um, so it's a little unclear what the relationship for billing would be going through Roar. And also Roar doesn't track the web domain. So we couldn't put the Ames Lab email address, for example, is associated both with the United States Department of Energy and with Iowa State University. And so I'm not sure if this is a complete solution, but this is definitely something that could be improved. Uh, next slide, please. Speaking of Ames Lab, let's talk about funding and awards. Uh, this is definitely what I would call problematic metadata. Um, so when we publish data sets, I try and link to federal awards, but this is really difficult. Um, award ID numbers from every agency are different. Some of them are so different that they look fake when I see them because they are have many more numbers or different conventions than the ones I usually see. Uh, discovery and verification of awards is very difficult right now. There's no good central database for current awards and past awards with enough details that I can like query just like PI names and stuff. And attribution guidelines for awards like within statements of acknowledgments and papers versus within metadata are a little, I haven't seen any set of unified standards for this and it would be really good to get this kind of covered. And we also are mostly focused on the grant awards, but we have things like cooperative agreements and contracts that are currently not easy to track. So AIMS Laboratory, as I mentioned earlier, they operate under a DOE contract number with us and they have project numbers. And these are not things that are currently tracked in most of the award databases. Uh, CSAFE, which is a NIST uh, funded cooperative agreement with Iowa State and three other institutions has the same issue. Um, I've been submitted three different types of numbers about this cooperative agreement over four years, and I do not know how they all relate together. It's very opaque for me as a repository manager to try and figure this out. And so more transparency and standardization here, I think would really help. Next slide. Uh, incomplete metadata. So data and data sets is kind of a mess right now. Um, I just got a notification, I'm gonna run out of time. So I do wanna just note that there's no coordination between publishers and repositories right now. And with the upcoming OSTP changes and NSM 33, uh, which is about PIDs for authors, coordination between these things is gonna be more important because we're gonna have data due at time of publication. And without coordinating with the repository, this is going to be a little harder to coordinate. And it's also important to note that you cannot currently query which publications have data or claim to have data. There's no filters for that. There's no way to do searches for that kind of thing very easily right now. So Howard, I know I'm about out of time, so I can um, we can end it there. Okay, I'll do the summary of gaps and next steps. So just more standards and standardization, um, improving metadata verification and talking about who and how can do it. Um, and also doing the post-publication updates and enrichment and improving communication between data and text publishers would be fantastic. Thank you very much. Great, well, that was a great session. Um, a huge thank you to Andrea, Sasha, and Megan. And now it's time for getting some questions going. So let's bring all of them back to the screen. Megan, stay on camera, please. So we heard a lot of uh, different things as you folks were talking. Um, and you know, one of the things that's, that struck me is this thing about 
the, the, the time of the metadata. I think Sasha, you may have mentioned it. Um, how important is that? I mean, you know, to be able to assert when that metadata is valid or invalid or when the time's out. What do you think? Well, let me let me start. Um, I think uh, the challenge with uh, metadata in terms of uh, reading the publish agreements is that um, it is possible that uh, during the production process, uh, the author the authors will want to change who the corresponding author is or what uh, his or her primary affiliation is. Because we have to validate this metadata, we have to do it several times during the production process, uh, upon submission, um, during production, and finally just before the validation, I mean before the publication, um, before publishing. So uh, it is a challenge to um, validate this metadata uh, throughout the production cycle. Anyone else? So I would say coming at the under, other end of the process, when we're trying to find metrics, um, I would say that we want as much metadata for as long as possible. Um, Sasha mentioned that maybe the production metadata is ephemeral, but that actually has a lot of value for um, people looking at how our processes are being used, especially if it comes from either library funding APCs or a read and publish agreement. We, will, we are gonna wanna know that much later down the road. Um, and then if you look at it from say an archival perspective or historic perspective, that's going to be the meat of the primary sources in 20, 30 years. So I would say that, you know, metadata, we, I like to say that the DOI is like a tattoo, but we maybe need to have a tattoo in white ink underneath with all the metadata so that that also sticks around. Um, while it can be changeable and it can be updated and iterated upon, um, I wouldn't want to say, see it going anywhere. Okay. Um, any last comments on that one? Otherwise I'll move to some of the audience questions. Okay, so let's start off with Mark's question. So Mark Donahue mm -hmm. asked us, uh, what monetary incentives currently exist to convince publishers to invest in producing better metadata? If metadata becomes the product instead of the article, will that be looked upon favorably? Right now, met metadata is typically free, which, uh, which can explain partly why it's so bad. Anybody want to take a stab at that? Can we appeal to their better angels? It's the right thing to do to make science work well. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say as a librarian, um, gosh, that would be great. And that was the slide I had to skip was the clutter of um, uneven metadata quality that results in user confusion and benefits no one, including the publishers because they're not getting people to their publications. Okay. Andrea, any thoughts? Nothing from you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, let's let's move on to maybe a, a question from uh, Sarah Nasser. So Megan's comments on recording funding IDs is a very tricky area. I wonder if there's an opportunity for sponsored program offices to work with libraries to sort out the grant numbering issues and how they might be interpreted and captured. Not entirely sure there's a solution for this but the SP offices will know something about which grant numbers are routinized and how to interpret them. What, what do we think? Uh, I can say that that is definitely on my radar and Sarah, it's good to hear from you. Sarah used to work at Iowa State University for those of you who don't know. <laughs> yeah, I would say the same. We're actually looking to um, Department of Commerce to make some definitions and standards across the department. So that would cover us, NOAA, um, Census, a couple other, um, DTIC, a couple other agencies. No, excuse me, not DTIC, sorry, Roberta, um, NTIA. As far as I know, uh, there was a, an effort uh, in Crossref to create a grant registry. However, I don't know where this stands. That would be great if that came to pass. 
So um, I can, I'm not a member of Crossref, um, but we do a lot of work with Crossref. Crossref certainly does have an effort going on about grants and award IDs. And there's a lot more, there's a lot of work being done in this space. And I'm confident that we're going to hear much more about that in the coming months. I don't know if somebody from Crossref that's maybe on today's talk wants to jump in on the chat or, or something like that. Okay. But I think uh, Sasha, they will, we'll, um, I, I know for instance, that we ourselves are embarking on a, a bit of work about research resources with CSIRO and, uh, and learning from our lessons of working with the DOE labs. So I will definitely be looking to use the, the Crossref award IDs in the future. So look forward to that. Uh, so then we have Roberta Schoen. Uh, we, it says here, we usually don't see author affiliations in Crossref data, so can't pull the items, meaning like employed by the, by the funder, to get a complete list. Is there any status on this? As a funder, I need to figure out um, all of the items that we fund. Please, we beg of you, us funders, we beg of you publishers to put that affiliation data in there. We know that it exists, it shows up on the papers, um, we know that Web of Science goes in and recaptures that and creates um, uh, their own index of who is affiliated with what agency, but please, please put it in there. It would make our lives so much easier. So and just to focus on that for a second, so you're asking for affiliation data for all of the authors, not just the contributing author or corresponding author. We want it for everyone, please. And as, as um, publishers, many publishers uh, we included, we do put this uh, data in our markup. However, um, I don't think uh, Crossref as a uh, interchange hub captures uh, this information. Okay. Um, <laughs> So Catherine Kaiser asks, I don't know if we can make this value judgment, Catherine, but um, I'll ask the question on your behalf. It says, is, is there a publishing organization, not-for-profit or government entity that is closer to being less bad in terms of quality and completeness than any others, even uh, for any major components? Anyone who want to dare tackle that one? I, I mean, I'll just say, even with like nonprofit libraries, quality is very across the board, depending on maturity of like their models and the systems they're using, because not all of our systems we use produce good metadata also. So that's the factor as well. In, ter in terms of Crossref, it uh, puts out for its members the reports on uh, compliance um, with the metadata integrity. However, I don't think there are any disincentives um, for a publisher to improve their metadata. So that's a, a consciousness decision. And just to note, by the way, some people are answering um, in, the, in the QA window. So I'm not going to be repeating all of those, but you're welcome to look at those. Um, as they're, they're definitely having some correspondence about corresponding author versus all of the authors. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so I'm just sticking with the affiliation for a moment. Um, and by the way, Tara, if I miss anything in particular, just jump in here and tell me. Um, it says here from Ted Haberman says affiliations are much more common across ref than than orchids, and we need orchids too. What do you folks think about that? Yeah, I definitely concur. Um, at the funder ID level, that's going to give us the picture of, at least in our case, what NIST is doing as a whole. But authors also want to know what they are doing. And we want to know what, say, down to a division level. So that's 25 authors versus you know our 2,500 or 3,000 um, that we have at NIST. So yeah, both are extremely important for our metrics. Yeah, and by the way, Maria has typed in here, um, Maria being from from Roar, she said that Cr Crossref has now opened its doors for Roar. So yeah, Maria, so basically publishers can start 
putting in raw information in, into their feeds because the Crossref schema um, did start supporting that um, as of the end of last year. Uh, let's see here. So Vincent says the fact that the organization is an author's affiliation or funder is actually part of a larger organization is often not mentioned in the journal article. Publishers can use a lookup to pull in PIDs for the organization that are mentioned in the text. Would it be useful or practical to also pull in PIDs for parent organizations? Or since the hierarchical relationships can change, um, is it better to keep responsibility with FunRef and, um, and outside of the article metadata? So that kind of plays into, Andrea, one of the questions you were asking about a bit before about you know, levels of hierarchy, so childs and parents. So we tend to use, for the affiliation, we tend to use our lab at the lab level, but that's related. Those roars are related in a parent child. Um, so I wouldn't think that we would need to pull that parent information down because it exists out there. I mean, that's part of that, you know, knowledge graph. Um, but I'm open to arguments for why we should. Um, I can I concur with Andrea. We need to record only one um, uh, uh, hierarchical granularity level on an ID like uh, ROR, ROR ID, and then um, there is an external data source such as ROR registry where all those hierarchical relationships up and down could be pulled from. Yeah, there's also the need to support not just strict hierarchies as I should with some of the Iowa State things. We have these cross affiliations, so like research centers that are maybe managed by one institution, but part of five others gets really tricky. So what would be your solution for that, Megan? What would I your... don't. I, that is, I don't know, um, but being able to easily query the ROAR and then be able to find out if an author is affiliated with that other organization, I think is the next step, right? So list of orchids associated with an organization might be the next step to solve that. But that's pretty complicated. Or, or like a cross ref funding registry, um, the ROR registry could be enhanced uh, to include uh, related information. So not only strict up and down part of um, uh, hierarchical relation by syndagmatic relationship between uh, the related organizations. And that would uh, help with identifying the related uh, related organizations. Maria, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that's already available. We Maria, just... you can, yeah, you can use chat or whatever you'd like to use to answer the question. So um, we're almost out of time, but let me ask you each, and I'll give you an opportunity to kind of feed into something that's going to feed into our poll in a moment. And some of you already said it, but if you were to pick one piece of metadata that you feel is usually wrong or impossible to obtain, what would that be? It's not impossible. Okay. It's, it's that affiliation information. Um, we pulled down from Crossref beginning of the year um, anything that came back with NIST in an affiliation, and 95% of those affiliations were deposited by us. So no one else is using them. I okay. would say, in addition to affiliations, it is um, award IDs and grant IDs. Okay. Uh, I agree with Sasha. And then I would really like to be able to query if things have data sets or claim they have data, because right now that is impossible to track systematically or even get a good picture of where that research data is and at what scale it exists at. 
Um, well, that brings us to the end of this session. I want to thank everyone uh, for for that. Um, we're going to now go into a 10 minute break. Um, but before I do that, I actually want to share my screen. <laughs> um, so I want to thank again our sponsors, which is ACM, Clarivate, ACS, AIP Publishing, Geoscience World, and STM. And uh, as we go into the break, I'm going to bring up a poll, and Tara is going to type in the URL to this poll. It'll be a two-question poll. Um, so let me uh, flip over to that. Hopefully you can all see that. So if you go on to the, the Menti uh, link that Tara is going to put into chat, you can uh, start to fill in, in that poll. And the first question of the poll is, what is one piece of metadata that is missing or often incorrect? And Tara, we did have a comment that chat was turned off for people. So maybe you can work. Yeah, I just, for some reason, so I've just reset chat and Q&A. Okay, great. So it looks like we're getting some feedback into the Menti poll, which is great. And for those of you who are, who are keep, keeping score, it did look like at one point we had about 148 people attending this, not counting our esteemed panelists. So that's a, a really good turnout. Oh, interesting. Okay. So affiliation and data sets and are, are big in there, but you're seeing lots of other interesting little pieces come up here. And by the way, we don't throw these away. We do use them here at Chorus and we do publish these along with our, our findings in the, fun, in, the, in the working paper that we publish after each forum. I'm gonna let this one go for just a few more minutes. It looks like it's still moving around. Okay, it looks like it has settled down. Oh, no, there's a few more still coming in. All right, I'll move us on to our second question. It looks like we've got a good number on there. Let's move on to our second question. So from the audience, how do you fix your metadata? Does no one fix their metadata? There we go. <laughs> Sasha fixes all the metadata apparently. Wow, that's this is a wordle manually be coming out big and strong. A lot of manual work. And a bit of vendor assistance. So our second session is going to all be about some solutions for fixing metadata especially about scholarly metadata. So this is good as a good feed into that discussion, I think. Scott, hopefully he'll be able to use some of this. It looks like people are also finally been able to get things into the chat. We apologize about that, sorry. Zoom apparently changed some of its default settings. So we didn't pick up on that.
Okay. Looks like our answers are slowing down there. Looks like some people are doing some fixing, which is good. Big fan of people fixing here at Chorus. We do try to give feedback to our member publishers about uh, incorrect and or missing data that we see at least on an annual basis. And I will say some of our members are really good at going back and fixing the data. Um, others, um, not so much. Well, we, we won't name and shame, but you know who you are. All right, I think I'm gonna switch us back. Thank you everyone for filling that out. Do appreciate that. How are we doing about getting participants back online, Tara? I don't think, well, we, you know, a few folks dropped off, but they might be able to come back. Uh, All right. So Scott, shall I turn this over to you? You and your panel? Or yes, just... I'd be happy to. Thanks, Howard. And yeah. thanks too for that last survey question. Um, there were a lot of responses that indicated interest, awareness, and a lot of effort to try to close gaps, connect the dots with metadata. So I don't know if it's more difficult to state what some of the core problems are, like we heard in the last session, or to try to identify some practical promising solutions, like you're going to hear in this session. But I, I think there'll be some overlap in any case. And I'm really pleased that we have these, these three well-known speakers to uh, help to lead this, this next session. So I'll introduce Marjorie first. Um, Marjorie's going to go a little bit beyond the soup can label, you know, in terms of the framework metadata for content, uh, although that's important too. And I know Margie will talk about uh, standards that need to be uh, automated, accurate, consistent for the, you know, wrapper level metadata. But in terms of going deeper into what is the content about, uh, how does it connect to other concepts? Uh, that's really Margie's specialty. And I think that'll be a topic she'll get into as well. So Margie, let me turn it over to you. And again, thanks for joining the panel today. You bet. I'm really glad to be here. It's an interesting session. I'm learning a lot. Um, I want to talk about some tools to improve scholarly metadata, um, but not just, next slide. <clears throat> the things we've already talked about, like the standards. I mean, if you go to the NISO website alone, you'll find a, a plethora of information that's incredibly helpful and uh, well-written, good guidelines um, for people who can't sleep at night. Reading standards is the way to go, I tell you. Um, there are, as Howard pointed out, a lot of consortiums working together to enhance clear data to share and check and enhance the metadata. Um, uh, we're doing actually giant strides compared to 10 or especially 20 years ago when we started doing all these kinds of things with, with um, a lot of sharing. <clears throat> a lot of the manuscript submission and peer review has been automated. We are not as um, behind the scenes as we once were so that there are some cases where you can pick out the information, the, the miscellaneous authors, the affiliations, compare them against a um, uh, cleaned up affiliation listing for all the synonymy that's there, as well as the synonymy for the way people say the author name, um, and put it all into a uh, record before the author really gets to doing the rest of the submission because submission, as you know, can be a uh, painful process. So the more automation that's there, the more likely that authors are going to at least review what somebody suggested was the appropriate terminology for them. <clears throat> so we're enhancing scholarly and learned publishing 
pretty rapidly around the world with the goal of high integrity, accurate, and consistent content. Next. Next, please. But, you know, there's something to be said for improving the content itself along the way. There are lots of um, things in the news about um, some of the data that could be included that's given to the populace at large. But even within our own publishing groups, there are lots of metadata filters and enrichment that can be done um, so that the varying names used in the content publication, content of the publication can be um, matched to um, authority lists to make sure that some of the information is, is, is better, stronger, more accurate. And I'm gonna go over a few of those, like gene names. There are over 19 synonyms per name. You don't have to search for every one of those. You ought to put in the right one to start with. Same thing with the medicinal plant names, over 17 synonyms. There's bad cell line references and suspect science topics that could be weeded out early in the um, editorial review process before it's ever published. So this kind of semantic enrichment not only supports creation of the metadata, but also the search down the line, whether it's full text or, or based on fielded um, JATS type elements and so on. And that would save a lot of time for both researchers and for the authors and lead to a lot of disambiguation in the formulation of a, uh, any platform for, for better science. So being able to reference these widely available authoritative tools or sources um, is crucial to the whole world. And they're particularly strong in the area of health. Next, please. <clears throat> so American um, College of Physicians, for example, um, has done a, a fair move to this sort of thing. And you see along the bottom of this flowchart slide, some of the things that they can reference when the article is submitted. Um, and then they can index it a few times through a um, um, taxonomy or a series of taxonomies to add keywords to not just the full article, but in line to the article itself. Next, please. Every walk of life is using constantly changing vernacular. And I actually think that first one on the left, the homeless, the unsheltered, the unhoused, the street people's hope, bows, vagrants, bums. I have 57 different synonyms that have been used for this agglomeration of people um, over time. And it's no wonder we can't settle these problems because every time we turn around, somebody's calling it something new something different. Um, and that leads to not finding a solution um, because we cannot get all the good ideas that everybody's had and centralize them into one place for search because somebody's invented yet another new name. And sometimes it becomes really difficult. If, if you have breast cancer, you should know that it's called metastatic breast cancer or stage four breast cancer or invasive breast cancer, and those all mean exactly the same thing. But if you're going to search for them, you will get radically different counts um, and different information. And so the information is siloed. We need to have those all brought together under the same title so that we can search it. You can change the title over time. I don't care which one is the preferred form, but let's gather them all together. And part of the challenge with getting any kind of information on Corona um, or COVID or SARS-CoV-2 or any of the many variations that there are of the Delta and so on is that we're calling it constantly different stuff. So I want to find out if it's good to get the uh, booster. Which booster? What are you talking about? The bivalent booster, the one that covers um, Omicron and BA4 and 5, or are you talking about a different kind of booster? It, the information becomes elusive because it's not corralled into a single area. Same thing with my own main field, which is ontology or taxonomy or thesaurus or knowledge map or knowledge graph or any number of other things, including tagging or indexing or semantic enrichment, blah, blah, blah. We use constant terms all the time. It's really frustrating. 
Next, please. So what are some of those things that you can find and pull from? I personally have worked with these and automated all of them, which is why I'm somewhat familiar with them, but you can go directly to the source. For example, the National Human Genome Research Institute publishes a list of human genes. Um, and if you put those against the text um, of articles with all their special characters and extensions and all of that, you can direct people to the preferred name, whether it's in search or in the actual publication, and get much better recall, much better precision, and remove a lot of ambiguity. Next, please. Medicinal plant names service out of the Royal Botanical um, Gardens at Kew has taken on a, a different kind of task in that there are a lot of plants worldwide that have medicinal purposes. People use ginger to calm their stomach or mint tea or chamomile or something like that um, to help them feel better. And the um, organic and generic um, world has exploded for medicinal cures. But there are some things that look a lot alike that are not alike at all chemically. Um, there are at least 42 different kinds of ginger. So if you're looking for ginger, um, you want that kind that's a good carminative and good for your stomach, but other people are going to offer you something else that's, that's not that at all. It is a ginger, but it's not the ginger that you were looking for. So we want to be careful um, in looking at those plants and misidentification of mushrooms or of medicinal plants causes a lot of deaths worldwide every year. If we were to link to the plant name record, at the medicinal plant name service, then you would have a higher level of confidence and you would not be publishing things that um, give the impression um, one way and the actual facts are different. These databases are constantly updated and linked to the International Plant Names in, uh, Index and IPNI and Q both. Um, try to keep all of that stuff up to, up to date. There's a full annual update and then there are updates in between. Next, please. Another one is the bad cell lines, which is offered by ICLEC. Um, that's a not-for-profit, loosely organized group um, that get together and, the, and along with the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics have compiled a list of uh, lines that are known to be um, some way contaminated. And if they're contaminated, um, if somebody's producing a work that includes a bad cell line, one would think that you would want to pay attention to um, the fact that they cited something that's incorrect and either alert the authors or just not publish the paper. There are at least 32,000 papers that have 32,000 that have worked with bad cell lines. And then of course they're cited all over the place, which only compounds the problem. So cleaning up the content by making sure that people are working with valid and not contaminated cell lines is crucial. Next, please. There's also a lot of um, pseudoscience that goes on. Um, and it doesn't mean that a paper that talks about autism and vaccination um, is a bad paper. It just means that maybe it needs to take a little extra time in review before it's published to make sure that um, they're not talking about other things. Next, please. SciGen is another one, which is a way to identify programmatic papers. Next. And a lot of it uh, organizations are using this, like in the PLOS uh, workflow, you see it down there in the left-hand corner. Next, please. I'm not talking fast enough. The last thing I want to talk about is video access, which is kind of a new frontier. Um, when stuff is put into video, it's like putting it in a microfilm and people can't find it. Next, please. So what we want to do is look at all those kinds of content um, and make sure that everything that we're gathering um, and gathering for those research communities, as well as the peer review people and the publications and web navigation 
are all brought together in a way that supports search and discovery. Next, please. And there's a fiscal benefit to all of that, which is at least a 34% improvement in search. And the Nielsen book study indicated that with much better and more complete metadata, we have 75% higher book sales. Next, please. So metadata is the key, whether you put it in line in the article or put it into a bibliographic citation that attaches to the article. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Margie. I heard a theme of community cooperation as being one of the goals coming out of the, the talk you gave. And I think it's gonna lead very much into the, the, the next talks. Uh, we're very lucky to have Chris Schillen be up next. He's the executive director of ORCID. And when I talked to Chris briefly uh, while he was preparing the presentation, he said, we have too much metadata. There's too much being exchanged and we need to think about uh, persistent identifiers and links, not more metadata. So Chris, let me invite you to expand on that. And again, glad to have you on board. I'll hand it over to you. Great, thanks Scott. And uh, very pleased to, to, to be here. It was a great setup. Um, and you know, just reacting to some of the discussion we had from the earlier session, we've got a, an insurmountable problem, I think, right? There's so much data in so many different places that the idea that we can clean up all of that up and get it perfect in every place, I think is just unrealistic. It's just too difficult, it's too big. We've been trying to do that for decades and, and we're not getting there. So I, what I'm going to talk about is maybe a bit controversial, but as Scott said, less metadata. If we focus on getting the right metadata in the right places, and then point us to that metadata in all the other places, then we can focus on getting one clean canonical copy of that metadata um, and refreshing it um, when it gets updated or improved or corrected. Um, to just go on to the next slide, please. So just very quickly, for those of you who don't know ORCID, we're an independent nonprofit organization launched in 2012, um, guided by our values and principles, um, committed to making our data open according to fair and open data principles. Um, next slide. Um, what we do is that we are a people-centric PID infrastructure provider, PID being persistent identifiers. We do three main things. We issue ORCID IDs, which are unique identifiers um, to any researcher or any person who would like to have one of them at no cost. We provide ORCID records, which are profiles or digital TV, uh, CVs, which connect um, that person identifier to all kinds of other uh, research uh, metadata, whether that's uh, employment, education, research outputs, etc. And last but not least, we provide a set of APIs which can be used by anybody, which enable anybody to query that metadata given they know the ID of the person. So moving on to the next slide. So to drill down that a little bit more, if you've never seen an ORCID record, um, this is our example, Sofia Maria Hernandez Garcia. Um, and if you click through to the next slide, Howard, well, actually, I think that one's in the wrong place. We'll come back to that one, but the next one again. So drilling down on that metadata, you'll see all that record. There are different um, um, areas of the record. Um, and first of all, we have what I call the, the person-centric metadata. So we have the, the person ID itself up in the top, top left corner the ORCID ID. Um, then in the panel on the left, we have some links um, um, related to that person, could be in this case, it's their, their researcher ID, um, their faculty prof profile website, et cetera. And we have some metadata about that person, principally uh, their name, alternate name forms, um, uh, their email address. If you click onto the next one, now, please. We then open up some of the aspects of that, that metadata. We've got a section of the record that talks about employment. This is where a researcher can add in their affiliations and you'll see the same kind of layout of the, the data here. So we, in this case, we've got an organization PID, which is a raw. Um, we've got some links related to that organization, linked to the ISNI, to the Wikidata entry, et cetera. And we've got some organization metadata the name and location of the organization. Similarly, now if you click again, 
we look at the work section, this is where somebody might put their uh, publications. So we've got a, a work PID, in this case a DOI, we've got quite a bit of uh, work metadata, we've got the, the title, the description, um, 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 etc. And we've got some work centric links such as ISSNs and URLs, etc. So if we go on to the next slide, um, the way that we think of, of um, um, ORCID is that it's a um, not just a registry of people, but it's a, it's a registry of relationships with other research objects or other research entities, such as works, research outputs, publications, um, grant information. I didn't show an example of that, but we, we can include that information as well, organizations. Um, and if you go onto the next slide, um, there are a number of other organizations, as you know, who do the same kind of thing. Um, they're focused on a uh, different kind of core objects. So at ORCID, we worry about um, uh, people being a kind of core object. We're a registry of people IDs. Uh, Crossref and data site, as you probably know, are registries of works. Crossref tends to um, um, concentrate on publications, data sites on data sets and other kind of deposited uh, research outputs, raw organizations. And what I've done here is tried to separate out um, the core uh, metadata that we each hold uh, in orange there. Um, so for ORCID, that's things like the name of the person, other ways that they're referred to, alternate names, their email address. For Crossref and data site, it's things like uh, uh, the title of the work, the source, the publishers, the date, that kind of thing. For RAW, as some people have already talked about, it's the, the name of the organization, uh, aliases, addresses, website, URL, et cetera. But you also see that we all store, if you look at any of our data sets, a lot of what I call foreign object metadata, right? Metadata, metadata about the things um, that uh, we point to. So as you saw in the ORCID record, we have publication metadata, which is similar to the data that Crossref hold as their primary metadata. Similarly, Crossref, as has been talked about in the, in the Q&A earlier, hold um, author um, information and affiliation data. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, this is an example if you talk about database theory of denormalizing data. It's always uh, useful to store copies of data in places where you want to access them um, for convenience, for performance, to provide certain functionality on top of that data. But I think what we don't do thoughtfully is distinguish between the primary metadata, the canonical metadata, the authoritative metadata, which I contend really should be held with those primary um, um, PID infrastructure providers, and the secondary data, that as long as you've got the link, as long as you've got the ID, as long as you've got the pointer, you can always go and get the fresh uh, copy of that metadata. Which brings me to my last slide in my conclusion, um, that if we want to improve metadata quality, the thing that we should focus on, first of all, is assuring that, that ensuring that PIDs are assigned to those primary research objects, um, but also making sure that the metadata that's deposited um, with those primary PID providers is the best it can be, and it's complete and accurate, and you know can be uh, up, should be updated at any time um, when we have better information. So, you know, definitive researcher names, email addresses should be with ORCID. Definitive titles, source titles, pub dates should be with Crossref and Datasite. Definitive org names um, should be with RAW. And as long as we are preserving then those relationships between these records, um, when something changes, when the quality of that definitive source metadata improves, uh, where a correction is made, we can all go get um, the accurate copy of that data, metadata um and updated so i think we need to be as a community more thoughtful about um where to store authoritative metadata about an object and when we have copies but simply they're cached or secondary copies for convenience and again going back to database theory what what we don't do very well um i don't think as a community is think about consciously normalizing or denormalizing data in database theory, denormalization means storing extra copies of stuff for convenience, essentially. Um, and binding means the point at which you resolve an object to its um, attributes. So uh, in, in our context, the time at which you uh, resolve a PID to its metadata. 
and we tend to do that very early right we tend to look up um for example uh, names and put them in papers when we publish them um and we have no choice in in the old paper world um but switching some of these things to late binding um would offer some benefits so for example um, some of you might be following the conversation about um trans authors who have a hard time getting their old names their dead names um out of the literature um, when they when they change their names and if we had late binding of names if we all stored pocket IDs and instead of um, um author names as our primary representing authors that would be easy to fix right we could just go get the, the current uh, name that the author wishes to be known from from the orchid api so this is quite complicated and and as a as a group of pid infrastructure providers we don't make it the easiest to do this um, but that's something we're we're talking to each other about um and um um we, what we want to do is to kind of work together to make it easier to access consistent metadata um, across all of our services, no matter whether you prefer to come to ORCID or Crossref or DataSite or, or raw to get that data. So let me stop there. Um, I'd be very interested to hear what you think when we get to the, the Q&A. Thanks very much, Chris. And thanks for starting your presentation, asserting that the metadata isn't intended to be perfect. But one strategy is to uh, kind of identify and recognize who might the canonical databases might be, and that these are often databases of uh, relationships, not just information. Yeah. I would like now to introduce uh, Ivan Kampfes from the OA switchboard. Uh, Ivan's going to tell us about the switchboard as a mission driven community tool with goals that are very practical and designed to help all stakeholders in the scholarly publishing, scholarly communication enterprise. So Yvonne, I'm very excited to introduce you and I'll uh, turn the Zoom over to you. Thank you, Scott, and thanks everybody and the other speakers for uh, setting the scene and uh, giving me an opportunity to indeed talk about practical uh, improvements and opportunities to do so. Uh, thanks, Andrea, in the first session to say this is just the right thing to do. We need it for a well-functioning research ecosystem. And as Chris also stressed, enable ro robust connections uh, between uh, elements and reduce friction. And the switchboard is all about incremental improvements and practical solutions. Um, in case you don't know, as um, a central metadata exchange hub, a mission-driven community-led initiative designed to simplify the sharing of information between stakeholders about open access publications throughout the whole publication journey. And my talk will also be um, partly covered in a blog post that will go live tomorrow. Next slide, please. Just a brief summary. Uh, initial meeting, key stakeholders, which are research funders, institutions, and publishers already back in 2018, uh, a project that delivered a minimum viable product and key principles, quite important for a mission-driven organization. A legal entity foundation, uh, Stichting, was founded in October 2020, and we've been live as an operational solution since January 1st. And it's really a combination of a mission-driven community where we're sharing best practices and lessons learned, and we'll, we'll get to that, but also a practical tool, which I show on the next slide. It's really a technical hub um, uh, where metadata are, uh, are being exchanged and, and really important leveraged by PIDs because the routing of these messages between, say, a publisher as stakeholder one and then university as stakeholder two is, is being done on the basis of ROAR identifiers. So here comes the, the super importance of the uh, author affiliations and using identifiers to, uh, to recognize those. Um, in essence, it simplifies the sharing of information, but information really being metadata, supporting various use cases. And what is really key is the standardized messaging protocol and shared infrastructure. Next, please. So when it comes to improving scholarly publishing metadata, the theme of today's webinar, we've learned a thing or two in those uh, three, four years that we've been underway. Uh, really quite critical um, metadata and persistent identifiers should be determined and captured at the source and by the source. That's where they originate and, and that's the ones who know what it is. Um, 
it can be different uh, dependent on the situation and can even be different parties uh, at the same event. Um, a grant being issued, uh, the, the funder plays a role and the researcher plays a role to identify themselves. So indeed this whole idea, Chris also related to it, uh, of getting it once and cleaning up is, is uh, I don't think the, the way to go. Also because metadata are time specific and event specific, uh, they may change over time the values and it is important to capture the event based and time specific values of metadata. What this means, a great example, there was already a question in the chat, the corresponding author at submission might not be the corresponding author at publication. That's just one example. And thirdly, organizational stakeholders and that being research funders, publishers and institutions should be in control of their own metadata. Don't expect a third party to solve it down the line or some AI engine down the line and therefore keep their own data secure. Next, please. And having said that, that builds actually on this, there's no uh, absolute truth. That's probably something we all know, but super relevant when, when having the um, um, illusion maybe that we can get this right once and somebody else will fix it for you. So then getting really practical, I have next slide, please. And then the next one. Um, how do we contribute with the switchboards to uh, improving metadata? And now I start with one slide on what we don't do. Just to be honest and in full transparency, what do we not do is, is clean up your metadata. So if you're the source as a publisher or if you're the source as a funder, we're not cleaning it up. You've heard our principles and the lessons learned uh, that I shared before. Uh, we also don't take responsibility of what comes out, reports coming out of the switchboard as being a message hub, being kind of the mailman. Uh, is uh, the responsibility of the one who sends it. And also to connect uh, is, is not part of the switchboard. We're really lean message up. And you might wonder why are you here? What are you going to talk about? Well, next slide please, because the last part of my presentation is five slides, five examples of what we do do to help improve scholarly metadata. First of all, build a community of like-minded spirits. The switchboard itself as a killer application better management information for publishers. And I think there was in the chat or the Q&A also the question about monetary benefits to convince publishers to invest in uh, improving metadata. Beyond, besides, it's the right thing to do. This is also a very cost-effective and super powerful way to get better insight in your own portfolio. And that can help you to develop business models and, and OA strategies. Um, reuse of a smart matching tool that we've developed in the switchboard for Outside the switchboard, this is to get from, uh, and I'll explain that in more detail, but to get to these identifiers, get to these raw identifiers uh, where it isn't available so far in the system. And this will bring efficiency, again, a cost saving for your own processes as a publisher and reduce friction in the whole flow further down the line um, and avoid the cost of rekeying and market research. Let's go to the next slide. I'll go through if I have time. Please uh, alert me if I uh, if I need to speed up. I want to get to the uh, smart matching by all means. Um, yeah, the community, it's a soft side of things, but it's critically important uh, because really, even though I mentioned it's not part of the technical switchboard solution, out of our community has come to incredibly powerful solutions and I'll discuss them in more detail in, in, the, in the next. Um, a custom connector and a private data store. So being around the table with all these parties and talking about the challenges, we have come up with uh, solutions and also direct lines of communication for direct feedback uh, from institutions back to publishers on their metadata quality, which has helped to improve. Next one, please. Uh, yeah, the killer app, it's rather simple. If you see the point of transparency and reporting in an automated way um, uh, to, to institutions and research funders, and also with the uh, OSTP around the corner, having to report and wanting to report maybe also to research funders, um, there is a, a motivation and incentive for participating publishers to improve the data quality to be able to do that. Because what comes out of the switchboard, uh, the standardized format is JSON, which uh, takes everybody uh, everywhere. The next one. The better management information. This is connecting the dots, uh, as was already mentioned before. So what out of our community has come up as a solution is uh, don't wait for others to solve it. Don't wait for the interoperability to happen, uh, except that there is event-based and time-based values for these metadata values is uh, bring the sources, use open 
open APIs and most fortunately most vendor systems have them uh, to bring together uh, data from uh, editorial systems, uh, publication, uh, Jets XML, version of record platforms, e-commerce systems and, and what have you and store the metadata values based on their events. So this example of corresponding author, store them in the private data store uh, based on the event and keep that in your own environment. Um, keeping it secure uh, as a publisher in this case provides incredible value for yourself also in management information. The next one. The smart matching tool, if publishers connect to the switchboard with an API, we have a suggester tool, smart matching, that is based on three things. If you have a Ringgold ID, but you don't have a Roar, uh, the smart matching, one of the three options is to help you to get from Ringgold to, to Roar. Uh, if you have um, uh, only full text, uh, uh, free text affiliation for the author uh, with the Roar API, uh, we are uh, uh, using uh, affiliation matching and get to Roar ID. And we have introduced and working with ORCID and their API. If there is an ORCID for the author in there, we, we go and call the ORCID record and look up the affiliation there. And this is done as part of the switchboard. Again, if publishers connect through the API, but since we're doing everything open source, this one is available for everybody to use upstream. This is way too technical for now. There is no time, but there is a, this, a documentation and a, and a, a nine minute presentation on how this works uh, available. I think this is a great opportunity. My last slide, I'll speed up. The market research, somebody asked also before about how can we get more raw IDs into Crossref? Come and join our webinar at the end of this month. We're doing a market research project at the moment with Ludo Waltman from CW2S and a number of switchboard publishers where they've done all this work that I presented before. They have the PIDs, they have the enriched and the, they have the metadata, they have the ROARs, but they don't make it yet into the currently applicable data feeds into Crossref. So how can we not only have them, but also Put the, and use them for the switchboard, but also make them available in Crossref. And we're uh, working with Crossref also to find ways to make that happen. So last slides. What's next? We will just continue with our community uh, and practical tools and solutions. And we believe in incremental improvements and, and practical solutions. And I invite you to, uh, to join us in that endeavor. Thank you very much. And thank you very much as well, Yvonne. It was a wonderful presentation and we're all very much looking forward to seeing how the OA switchboard shapes up over the next, next few years. And this brings us to the Q&A portion. And I would like to throw out an initial question to the group. There's been a lot of talk about the canonical metadata and where it comes from. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on how much of the metadata noise problem is because the metadata is not being provided by the right party initially. And if so, what we do about that. Are there any thoughts uh, in response to that, that question? I'm happy to take that, Scott. I was indeed actually making that point. Um, authoritative data from the source. Uh, I think indeed there's a huge risk if we uh, uh, expect third parties or AI tools or whatever down the line who are not the owners, who don't really know why, uh, yeah, who we're dealing with and what we're dealing with to um, assign metadata or PIDs. So yeah, I think that is part of the problem, expecting maybe that somebody else will solve it. Uh, whereas, um, yeah, I call for at the source. And again, that's not always the publisher, not always the author, not always the funder, not always the institution, but actually could be all. And I think that's what we need to uh, start to see that there is not one single truth there. Yeah, and maybe I can follow up kind of a related thought in that, you know, the, the, the nice thing about the PID providers is they can accrete metadata from different sources. And certainly that's true of, of ORCID, right? So um, one of the things that we're, and by the way, we know we don't have complete or perfect metadata, right? Um, at the moment, um, one of our focuses is to create the incentives for more people to provide us with metadata. Uh, and I challenge anybody on the call, and there are a lot of you, which is great to say, if you have authoritative metadata about people, you should be contributing it to, to ORCID, right? If you're if you're a publisher, 
you should be contributing the, the works metadata to ORCID. Thankfully, many publishers do that, and, and that's enabled by what we call the auto-update workflow from Crossref and Datasite, which is great. Um, universities, we have many university members at uh, ORCID. We're grateful for their support, but the number that actually contribute affiliation data into ORCID records is quite small. And we heard earlier on in the Q&A session that um, affiliation data is, is one of the things which is causing the biggest problems at the moment. So I you know, say to you, and we provide tools to, to institutions to do that. If you hold authoritative you know, affiliation data, which is a university you probably do, put it somewhere where everybody else can get to it, right? And then funders, which I think, uh, uh, you know, for long and complicated reasons, are maybe furthest back in the journey um, to, to PIDs and metadata, assign DOIs to your funding awards, contribute those to the Crossref registry. That's all possible today. I know it's a lot of work for funders to implement that and the systems landscape is not always the most up-to-date, but that's how we'll make things better, right? Not by trying to get perfect metadata everywhere, but contributing the metadata that we hold, which is good and authoritative to places where other people can get to it. I don't know if I answered your question, Scott, but I, you gave me an opportunity to, to get that in, so I did. <laughs> Thanks for the response. <laughs> I'm going to go to some of the questions that are on the panel here. Was, was there another response to that? Yeah, I just wanted to add a little history. When we were first putting together Crossref, there was a committee convened for the contributed metadata identifiers that we would be allowed to use in Crossref because a lot of people made their living um, contributing the additional metadata for their own secondary publications like chemical abstracts or physics or any number of organizations. And so I'm wondering if it's time to revisit some of those base principles. We didn't use all of the Dublin Core metadata options. We only used a subset of them because of that, um, that need at the time. Things are certainly opening up with metadata uh, in Crossref in particular. The citation metadata is open now for most publishers, and abstract data is also becoming a lot more common uh, than it used to be uh, through, through Crossref. Uh, I'll get to some of the questions that have come through. I'll look at both the chat and the, the Q&A box. Uh, Judy Luther has a question about uh, audio and video. What is the best solution for IDs for audio and video? Uh, is it one of the existing PID vendors or a new one? Uh, what are your thoughts on? Uh, I don't. Um, so the entertainment industry is very, very interested in this, and they have a, a consortium budding, but not yet extent because it's highly competitive. But there is the international ID uh, identification number from the um, from ISO. And starting by identifying your material with that ID, it goes a long way to contributing to the long term on it. Just to jump in there, I mean, I think I think context is much more important than format. Um, for example, the entertainment ID registry that that uh, Marjorie mentioned is kind of focused on commercial videos. Both Crossref and Dataset will happily give you a a, a DOI for a. Um, um a, a, a video or an audio clip in a, in a scholarly context right so we shouldn't get too hip top they're just research outputs and works and the format doesn't really fundamentally change anything there that's true <laughs> putting an ISAN on the data is helpful as well yeah yeah that was my question too is there a disincentive or a disadvantage of having multiple ids does that confuse things to have the ids from the two different contexts or standards or can it only help well, Chris is right that there's a uh, there's the format problem. So is it streaming media? Is it CD? Is it a videotape? Is it a um, 16 millimeter film and so on? And all of those different formats um, may get a different ISAN or a different international standard audiovisual number. Um, and um, that's at the moment up to the producer. Just, just to jump in there as well, Scott. So I'd say use as many IDs as useful for the workflows that you want for the objects, right? And the analogy I often use here is if you kind of go into the setting screen on your, on your phone, on your mobile, you'll see lots of IDs. You'll see something called an IMEI, you'll, call, you'll see a MAC address, you'll see an IP address, you'll see a phone number. Those are all IDs that are useful in different contexts 
the functions that the phone needs to do, right? So just be thoughtful about what workflows, what functions do you want to achieve with those IDs and pick the ones that are, that are helpful. And a lot of them are called out in the um, new <clears throat> NISO technical report, the RP41, which has to do with uh, audiovisual materials and metadata. Sounds like some other uh, late night reading you're recommending. Right. <laughs> Uh, we have a question from David Haber. I'm having a hard time understanding how that openness of the API would work without manual authentication. Yvonne, I think this is for you. If we're using ORCID metadata to update article metadata at submission and or publication, without authentication, then there's no way to ensure that this new published or potentially published object is properly attributed to a researcher. In other words, uh, the spoofing problem would become massive. Yeah, that's an excellent question um, about validated uh, raw IDs. We're uh, very much looking into that, working on that, of course, optimizing and, and uh, the learning mechanism and, and, and what have you. But yes, there's definitely uh, a lot of publishers out there who use a combination of automation uh, as much as possible, but at the end, um, either do a quality check uh, themselves in combination with the author or not, or really have the philosophy that it is the responsibility of the author to get that right. Uh, so again, uh, that's the same point about the authoritative data from source. People might have a different opinion on uh, on who, who the source is. Is it upon the, the publisher to, to assign that based on what they got provided? Or, or do you really go out of your way to get the author to complete it? And so it's a really good question. It's uh, it's 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 tr it's not trivial. No, I'll, I'll point out that there was a follow up comment too that spoofing is particularly a problem with the use of ORCID for NSPM 33 for the federal government. Um, another question about the AO the OA switchboard. Does OA switchboard provide support for post publication peer review or retractions, corrections, revisions, or does the process end at initial and it's in quotes publication? Yeah, that's also a really good question. The use case that we're live with at the moment is uh, supporting publication notifications and related metadata for the version of record. But there is an option, there is a, there is a possibility to send an update to the message if it turned out to be incomplete or incorrect and the system keeps the keeps a link uh, between the these uh, messages um, so that the recipient knows that there is a there's a link there. And we are exploring, I think that's related, uh, other uh, use cases, but since we've just started, we're really focusing on getting this one right, but you can imagine indeed any uh, exchange of information that is supported by metadata between those three parties can in theory easily be supported. Uh, it's just a matter of time and money, yeah. Thanks, Yvonne. There's one more question on the Q&A, and then well, as we have time, we'll look at the other comments in the comment area. Uh, from Christi Christina Drummond, Thinking of the system-wide change disruption involved in shifting fully to PI uh, to PID authorities, what do panelists think we need to get people used to improving metadata upstream? Incentives, process, funding, more conversations, something else. In incentives is it right that you know maintaining metadata, whether you're doing it locally or or at source, is a pain. It's a cost. Um, nobody's going to want to do it unless they can see the benefits, right? So um, kind of the flip side of, of what I said earlier, which is if you have authoritative metadata, um, contribute it, you know, if you need metadata, use it. Uh, and certainly we think, um, having talked to our kind of community at ORCID, um, that the strongest incentive we can provide to individual researchers is to save um, administrative, duplicative, form filling of the same metadata. Researchers hate that. They'd much rather be doing research. Um, so, you know, create that incentive by in a system that you have that uses metadata, pull it in from an authoritative source, or at least give the um, give the user the opportunity to do that. You know, if they prefer to um, type it in manually, then sure, don't stop them, but pre-populate that form for them using metadata of an authoritative source, because A, that will make them happy. B, will give them more time to do stuff they should, would probably be paid to do in the first place. And C, it provides incentives for them to have, to improve the quality of the metadata at that source. 
Thanks, Chris. Are there any other thoughts from the panel about incentives or disincentives to uh, to, to provide the, the correct metadata? Probably, I agree. Sorry, incentives. Yeah, <laughs> probably wouldn't hurt to uh, get published a few horror stories about mixing up authors and mixing up affiliations and so on that um, people have suffered just increase in awareness campaign. Uh, so I'm looking at the comments here to see if there are any other questions emerging. Uh, I think we've probably dealt with most of these that are in the comments now. So I'm going to raise a, uh, another point for uh, all the panelists uh, to respond to. Um, I'm wondering what is the most surprising thing that you've heard among the six talks today? Is there anything that really stands out? Maybe you weren't expecting to hear or that you hope to hear and it was said well and you you just want to reiterate it. Gosh, that's bad, huh? You should should have asked that up uh, up, up front. <laughs> Scott, then we would have remembered. Yeah. <laughs> to, to make, you know, no, I will. I will take it, Scott, because I even tweeted it uh, during this panel, which is uh, um, not good. But I wanted to share it, Chris. It's yours. If you have authoritative metadata, contrib contribute them to a place that people can get to. I think that was a, a incredibly important remark. Share it. If you are the authoritative source, if you own it, if you got it for that piece for that point in time, and share it to the uh, yeah to the place where others can get to it. Thanks, well, Chris. The one, I, the one I liked was also from Chris, which is, uh, is there too much metadata? I, I think we probably need to look at our overall, geez, we have so many organizations now that deal with metadata and it's confusing. I mean, it, it's where do I put my what? Um, and everybody's gonna say, well, put it with me, put it with me. But um, from an author point of view, where do I put it that can be populated so that it'll be available with everybody else? I mean, it's not clear how much of the data is shared across the entire metadata universe. And it's not clear um, why I should have to, as an author, keep putting in this stuff that I put in for the last 15 publications that I entered. And I know you can pull some data from ORCID and I know that Crossroffs has a lot of transwalks, but not everybody knows that. So I think um, it, it's not clear what the what the metadata consortia offer as a unified front. That also reminds me of a comment Howard uh, put in the, the chat about who really has the right to assert authority uh, for these different types of metadata. Uh, among data site and cross ref um, is is you know to who who do we give that uh, you know the the right to say I own the author uh, PID or the, uh, the the data set PID e even though there are the the key players emerging. Scott, just to to go back to your question now, I've thought about it. Um, something that wasn't surprising to me um, was that several of the speakers in the um, first um, panel. Um, highlighted the, the new challenges that are being thrown up by the reading publish deals, transitional arrangements, and, and, and such like. And I think one of the structural things there is that um, those arrangements are requiring us to connect metadata and systems we've never had to connect before, right? In, in the old world of pay for access publishing, you know, the, the publication workflow and the commerce workflow, if you like, of who pays for things are completely separate, right? And now they're entwined. So I'm not at all surprised that that's hugely challenging um, to sort out and requiring data to be in places that it's never been before or linked to places. Um, but I think it's also worth noting that um, the OA switchboard is doing a tremendous job of switching, of sorting that out and providing a solution um, to the problems and mixing both the concepts of um, metadata, but also transactions and messages um, because I think that's the way that we'll solve that problem. Yes, Chris, and in some ways there's more at stake for a lot of the, uh, well, for the stakeholders where the author beneficiary 
is or isn't going to get that APC paid based on the metadata that flows through the system. And talk about creating incentives, right? There's one huge yes. incentive there that the, the business models are going to demand. We saw some of these uh, problems happen. Yeah, if I can add to that, uh, again, Andrea's quote in the first session, it's the right thing to do, uh, and more broadly, to enable the, the robust connections uh, be, uh, between all these elements and for the ecosystem to work and for science to advance. So that was another one you asked for a, a very uh, important uh, point to repeat. Um, I want to make that point again from Andrea. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Howard has a question to everyone. I'll read it out to the group. Are there specific areas that people want to work together on? Do, are, is there is an outcome of this webinar um, identifying some area of co cooperation that's not happening or that we could make a renewed commitment to? Was that your thought, Howard? Yeah, thanks, Scott. So one of the things that we definitely want to do, and by the way, I've been doing more mechanical things than necessarily listening to the content as much as I'd like. So definitely going to hit that uh, play button on the recording So because uh, there was a lot, lot of stuff here. But we want to synthesize this and figure out what are the gaps? Where, where are the things that you know aren't being done? Who are the right players? Uh, of course, could be a right player, but certainly we can't play in every area. Um, I mean, the, the PID providers certainly have a role to play, but but equally, you know, we, we have the vendors that have a very large role to play and the institutions and the publishers all have their own domain knowledge, um, but they're all, also they all have their own gaps that they need fill. Um, and I think there's this is we, we thought of this conference when Scott and I were talking about this was really, uh, you know, it, we, we started talking because of the need because of transformative agreements, the read and publish agreements. I think it's Scott, you, where you and I started this, right. but we realized that there's a lot more to talk about. Um, certainly then of course, the OSTP memo came out with a real deeper focus on metadata. Um, and then having now attended the NISO meeting uh, this past week where there's tons of things to talk about. So NISO certainly has a, a play um, in these conversations, but are there some, are, are, is there something that came out today that we feel that you know, no one is touching, and and but yet it's really important. Um, is is there something here? And by the way, anybody from the any of the panels can come back onto the video and talk at this point if they'd like. Any thoughts? Well, Howard, maybe uh, actually the opposite, or a risk, or a warning uh, that we don't reinvent the wheel, and therefore these work, these sessions like this are so important. Uh, and I think it was Marjorie brought it up as well that people might not know how to get data out of Orchid or Crossref or whatever. And what I already see happening, and maybe it's already happened for decades, but then people see a problem and start to find a solution or or, or create a project group or get funding to solve it, whereas. I think these sessions like today are incredibly important to inform each other of what is going on and to build these bridges to avoid uh, even more initiatives uh, trying to solve the same same problem. It's a bit, little bit of cry of the heart. Yeah, cry from the heart. I think um, returning to the questions of incentive and disincentives, I think we need both uh, sticks and carrots. So of course, um, incentives are good, but naming and shaming to a reasonable extent could be a powerful disincentive as well. You think the disincentive, right. Okay. So Sasha, do you have an example of a, in your opinion, of, of something that would be an incentive for say publishers or researchers to um, improve the metadata? Oh, well, I mean, some of the organizations like Chorus or Crossref could uh, have an annual award or citation for the best uh, three publishers or content providers who mm -hmm. provide ex ex excellent metadata. <laughs> well, that is certainly a positive message. And on that, we will close out. I want to thank everyone, um, especially the speakers, for all the hard work that they put into today's event. Uh, Scott, thanks for again uh, bringing this to our attention and making it all happen. Um, the audience, I apologize about the earlier chat not being available, but you've, in the second half, you guys have come through, um, which has been awesome. Um, we do uh, take all of this and synthesize it, and we do save it all, um, and we do publish it publicly. So once again, thank you all. Um, and if 
I don't know what you've got going on a Friday, but otherwise have a wonderful weekend coming up. Take care all. Thanks to you, Howard and Tara as well. Bye. Thank you. Thanks everybody for participating. Bye.